Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this RareToGamingTech.com video, we're going to be discussing as well as analysing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up in the past 24 or so hours. Hopefully, you're having an amazing day. I want to begin this video with AMD's Milan processors. These are the next generation of Epic CPUs, which will replace Rome. They are powered by Zen 3, so basically the same CPU core that we find in the Ryzen 5000 series. And we actually now have a pretty good understanding as to the performance of these CPUs, thanks to a leaked benchmark and a couple of images of the actual CPU itself, albeit an engineering sample. This was first published on the website Billy Billy, thanks to a leaker by the name of Yuki ANS. Although I would like to give credit to Twitter user Harakaze5719, where I first learned about this um, for uh, basically tweeting it. But anyway, getting to the uh, discovery itself. Now, according to Yuki, the single core performance of this processor is improved to the level of Xeon, 500 points. They did not give an exact number, so it could be 499 or it could be, you know, 510 or something like that, but I'll just say 500 on the nose. Furthermore, we can see in the first image a CPU Z screenshot. Now, I do believe the benchmark was CPU Z and not something like Cinebench, but in the uh, image of CPU Z, you can see that there are eight processor cores which are displayed, but the scroll bar itself basically goes on for a lot longer. Unfortunately, we don't know the number of CPU cores which are present on the die. It could be 24 or 32 uh, cores, so we can basically guess. I'm probably going to say 32, but I could certainly be wrong. And there are also a couple of images of the engineering sample itself. So again, the performance of this CPU is impressive. 500 points-ish would mean that compared to the previous generation, we're looking at a low 20% improvement uh, single core performance again. How does that uh, mean Intel will compete with AMD? Well, that's where things get kind of interesting. It does bring me to an exclusive I had a couple of months ago, I believe. I was uh, mentioning that I was hearing that AMD's processor was really good. Um, in fact, in spec int Perth, I actually heard that it was outperforming Xeon. But I was actually told the worst part about all of this, as I covered in that video, which I honestly can't remember the name of uh, offhand. Uh, I'll try to remember to link it in the video description. But what I actually was hearing too is the worst part about this isn't just that AMD are beating Intel in terms of raw performance. They're doing so at lower power consumption as well. So that's kind of like the double whammy. If you're beating someone, but they can take solace in, well, you know what, um, <laughs> it's taking more power for you to do that. It's kind of like, well, whatever. But when they're literally beating you in every single uh, metric, power, possibly price, although we'll have to see what AMD charge, and also the actual raw performance too, that's when things start to get kind of bad. So the spec in Perth performance is obviously very much, well, reality, because AMD themselves at this point have confirmed that Zen Free's microarchitecture was designed around pushing single thread performance. And uh, I did mention in another video that, um, yeah, the purpose of Zen 3 was to put immense pressure on uh, Intel for two reasons. One, gaming, because Intel have had the refuge of gaming uh, for desktop. So it, there's no denying it that a 10900K is the fastest gaming desktop CPU at the moment. People can, you know, say that it's not worth the money or, you know, the 3700X with its accompanying platform gave you better upgradable options or, you know, PCIe 4 or whatever. But in raw performance, I am using it as my primary benchmarking rig. Intel sent me the CPU and I'm grateful to them for that. But 
the reason I'm using it is because currently it is the fastest gaming CPU without any question. But that will definitely change when Zen 3 comes out to all of my understanding as I've leaked previously and now AMD seem to have proven with benchmarks unless those benchmarks were ultra cherry picked or they basically were lying which I don't believe either is the case. I think there's a very good chance that I'm going to be switching the gaming for uh, GPU benchmarking or other uh, performance testing from Intel to AMD, which will be very interesting. But outside of my little bubble, um, or perhaps you know gaming's little bubble, single thread performance is also quite important too for high performance computing and server environments for a plethora of different reasons. Um, which, honestly, I'm not uh, as familiar with HPC and servers, so I'm sure others will probably be able to uh, give you a much better insight into that. But long story short, yeah, AMD are definitely bringing the pain here. Now, again, I do think Intel will be clawing their way back in an architecture or two's time, but it does mean, for now anyway, Intel are going to be getting kicked in the shin for both desktop and server. And it's going to be very interesting to see how the market reacts to this because it generally does take a while for the market to adapt because uh, I do know a couple of people who um, work in, you know, kind of server environments and uh, they've told me, maybe, maybe your experience is different, so do let me know. Uh, reach out to me on Twitter or comment in the video, so definitely let me know about this, but... It does seem that a lot of um, a lot of environments are typically more cautious, especially in production environments, to switch to a yet you know not so established platform because a it comes down to being familiar with what you you know with, with the products you know you're familiar with them, but there's also quite frequently optimizations in place for certain software, but. AMD's performance, raw performance now, is getting to the point where I do wonder even if those that software has been optimized for Intel, AMD's raw performance may be better. There are, however, some uh, caveats to this. Obviously, certain instructions which do benefit Intel will probably still run better on Xeon. So it's going to be interesting to see how all of this plays out on the market, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And... Well, we have to talk about Marve at this point. It seems to be, you know, required for every video for us to discuss the next generation AMD GPUs. We actually have some updated information for Narve 22. This is courtesy of Rogaine. There seems to be a 12 and a 10 gigabyte model of uh, this particular GPU. Now, the reason this is interesting is because while we don't know the actual cuts, in other words, whether there's differences to the number of CU or anything like that, or whether it's kind of more similar to what we saw with the um, 5600 and 5700 for desktop, where the number of CU was, well, identical, but with cuts in memory bus width, it would mean that we are going to be seeing a pretty impressive possible demonstration of how this architecture RDNA 2 can scale thanks to its caching system. Assuming the information that I've been given about Infinity Cache is accurate, this would most likely mean that the memory configuration in terms of uh, clock frequency and bus width would be just 160 bits wide, and I believe that the most likely clock frequency for the memory would be 14 Gbps. So if you do the maths on that, the 10 gigabyte model would sport 280 gigabytes per second bandwidth. That doesn't necessarily give us a whole lot to work on because we don't, of course, know the full configuration, at least for certain, unless the information which um, the Reddit poster STBLR uh, found was accurate, which seems to indicate we're looking at 40 compute units. So another possibility is we are looking at 160 um, 160 bit interface. And again, that would mean assuming 14 GBPS, we're looking at 280 gigabytes per second of bandwidth. And this would probably make sense because theoretically, 
the cache on the GPU would be significantly smaller. Another possibility is that we could simply be looking at slower clocked memory as well, but obviously that's just a guessing game of what clock frequency it would be. On the other hand, if we're looking at the 192-bit bus, which obviously 12 gigabyte would be, then that would mean, assuming once again we are uh, running the memory at 14 Gbps, uh, the GPU could have 336 gigabytes per second. So from STBL's, um, STBLR, excuse me, uh, information, and kind of trying to marry that up somewhat with Rogaine, to me it seems, again, assuming this information is correct, that we're looking at 40 compute units uh, fully enabled, possibly at 336 gigabytes per second of bandwidth, and again, with a pretty a healthy dose of uh, Infinity Cache. I was told that the highest end GPU is 128 megabytes. So whether that's 64 for the um, Narbi 22 die, I don't know because obviously half the number of CU, in theory, it would be half the uh, uh, cache. But again, that part is speculation. And then whether the um, the cut version of 22, which Rogaine mentioned, which just has 10 gigabytes of memory, whether that has still 40 compute units, but with the narrower bus of just 160, or whether that's, say, 36 compute units with 160, I don't know. So it's, it's quite fascinating anyway, in terms of just kind of spitballing ideas. As of the time I'm recording this video, we're only nine days away until AMD actually provides us all of this information, or at least a good portion of it. And at this point, I'm hearing very much similar things over and over and over and over and over again from multiple different people. I'm, at this point, pretty sure that AIBs have been briefed. I'm hearing it could be um, about two weeks, three weeks ago that AIBs have been briefed of some of the information, but apparently AMD still are keeping tons of info close to their chest, and they are not, even now, revealing all of the information to AIBs because they still don't want it to leak. I was told that um, by now two different people that the AIBs have only been briefed with, with uh, up to maybe Narve 22 or possibly Narve 21, but only the lower end SKU is not the highest end. But unfortunately, there's a lot of difficulty to really know what's going on. So I still feel that AMD will compete very well. I think that NVIDIA know that AMD will compete very well. And I think NVIDIA are kind of preparing for that. And I think they're prepped for that, honestly. Um, and I think it's going to be a wonderful time in the GPU market. I really do. I think it's going to be absolutely amazing for uh, users. And... Um, I think that uh, you're going to be able to build a ridiculously good system. Uh, just for example, I mean, let's just go with parts we know about for a second. The RTX 3070 would pair absolutely amazingly with something like a 5600, for example. Uh, again, you can sw switch the uh, 3070 out with the AMD equivalent, but let's just use parts we actually know roughly how they perform and all of that stuff and the pricing. So I think it's going to be an absolutely wonderful time to be a PC gamer because there are so many bloody options. And again, that's what I really like to see. I like to see the market have options. And also, while we are on the subject, I did mention the 3070. I do want to add a couple of little things which uh, has been discovered by uh, the videocards.com website. I won't go over all of this stuff because they are just specifications, but now... Definitely the RTX 3070 series. Yeah, things are really speeding up now. The 3070 is definitely coming. And manufacturers are AIB, so MSI and whomever else are starting to update their website uh, with specifications. Uh, in terms of specifications, we are looking at the 3070. Obviously, this stuff has already been confirmed by NVIDIA at 5,888 CUDA cores with 184 TMUs and 96 ROBs. And it is uh, GA104300. 
So the clock frequency in terms of base frequency is 1500 megahertz, but the boost frequency does vary, of course, depending on the um, manufacturer that is obviously creating the card. Uh, MSI, for example, for its Gaming X Trio, uh, the Gaming Trio is running at 1770 megahertz, whereas a Another card, for example, from, um, I don't know, Inno3D, it's running at 1785. Oh, by the way, I did a full review recently of the Gaming X Trio RTX 3080. So I'll try to remember to link that in the video description. I actually really like the card um, and had absolutely no issues with it. I know some people are uh, a bit concerned at the moment about certain uh, AIB variants of the GPUs, uh, the 30 series. Uh, because of the capacitor issues, I can say that for me anyway, even on the earlier drivers w without the fix from NVIDIA, uh, I have absolutely no problems with the Gaming X Trio and that's overclocking it as well. So uh, just letting you know, again, you can check out the review if you so desire in the video description. But yeah, so the 30 series is definitely preparing um, to launch. I, I fully believe that the 3070 is probably going to be about the best selling card in the lineup from NVIDIA. I could be wrong on this, but I think in general, um, I would say that the 60 and 70 series generally sell best. In fact, I'm actually double checking this now um, so that I don't look completely and utterly like an idiot. Uh, and this is a going by this team survey. So, you know, possibly wrong. But uh, as of the time I'm recording this video, uh, it seems like the GTX 1060 is uh, the most common at about 10.3%. It's actually going down a little bit. The percentage is obviously people are now starting to upgrade. Then it's the 1050 Ti, then it's the 1050, then it's the 1070. So, um, yeah, I think the RTX 3060, 3060 Ti, uh, as well as, of course the 3070 are going to sell absolutely like the best in uh, NVIDIA's lineup. I also recently had an exclusive about the 3060 Ti uh, pricing and release date as well as the RTX uh, 3080 20 gigabyte as well if you so desire to check that out. But I think that's just about it for this video. I know it's a little shorter than normal. However, um, I've got a few projects I'm currently in the middle of working on, so I need to kind of get back to that. But thanks very much for watching the video. The normal stuff, if you have enjoyed it, like, share, comment, and subscribe. And thanks to everyone who has been a recent subscriber. I have to say, um, it's kind of strange to see the channel just absolutely exploding at the moment in terms of subscribers. So I, uh, yeah, that's... Yeah, I can't really say anything else. I just, yeah, wow. Um, so I just wanted to thank everyone who has been a subscriber, even if you're, you know, new and you've just joined or if you've been a long-term subscriber. Thanks very much for all of the support. But we'll let you all go. Take care of yourselves. Bye.